Amen. Wow. Praise God. All right. Oh, God is good. Amen. I want to speak to something right now. Um, take out your calendar and mark this day off. Throughout the Old Testament, there's times where God told people to build monuments. Uh, the one that comes to mind is when they were crossing the Jordan River, the children of Israel were coming out of the desert into the promised land, and God told them to build a monument. One on the edge, but also one right in the middle of the Jordan. The symbolic nature of that was so that anytime anybody ever came and looked at those monuments, they would ask the question, why is that monument there? And that was to remind them continuously, constantly, of what God had done for them. Today is a day that you need to mark in your calendar as a day when God did something for you. You don't understand the significance of this yet, but you will in the months to come. But so you have a verse to share? While we, while we were singing, this portion of scripture uh, came to my mind. It's Ephesians 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of faith, the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering in your prayers, in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparable great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given not only in this present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, 
which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And somewhere else in Ephesians, it says we are seated with him in heavenly places. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and and uh, it's just cool because the text that I had today was Ephesians 1, verses 5 to 6. How many caught that? Don't believe me? It's right here. That's my text. How blessed is God, and what a blessing he is. He is the Father of our Master, Jesus Christ, and takes us to the high places of blessing in him. Long before he laid down the earth's foundations and had us in mind, he had settled on us as a focus of his love to be made whole and holy by his love. Long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. What pleasure he took in planning this. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift giving by the hand of his beloved son. Just let that soak in for a bit. It was his good pleasure. He took pleasure in this. Long before he laid down earth's foundations, he had us in mind, had settled on us as a focus of his love. Still don't believe God loves you? He loves you. He loves you, he loves you, he loves you. I ask God, what do you want me to share today? And he said, tell them I love them. So I am telling you, God loves you. And there is nothing on the face of this earth that can keep you from his love. Neither heights, nor depths, nor powers, nor principalities, nor things past, nor things to come. Nothing can separate us from his love. Now that's worth an amen. We have been seeing a release in this place that I have been anticipating for a number of years now. And when I tell you to mark your calendar, I mean that. What happened today in this place was surreal. What is going to happen is beyond our understanding and comprehension. We are seated in heavenly places. You know what that means? means I sit in the church in my chair and that's it. No. It means you are with Christ. He is up there and we are with him. Get that image. Okay? He is up there in heaven and yet we are with him. There is nothing on this earth that can prevent you from attaining your destiny. Absolutely nothing. And yet, the vast majority of people on this earth never reach their destiny. They never attain it. They never... And I believe this breaks the heart of God. Because I believe very strongly that God has predestined every single person on the face of this earth who has lived or will live. He has predestined them for greatness. Now I know in the church there has been this whole controversy over predestinationalism or not. Like they're either predestined or there's free will. Guess what? They're both right. We have a habit in the church of arguing the same side. 
and getting confused when we're both saying the same thing. And we got to stop that. You see, God has predestined every single person on the face of this earth for greatness. But not every person walks in their destiny. God has proven in his word that he desires that no one would perish. Okay? You've all read that verse? He desires that no one would perish. It's his will that nobody goes to hell. That's what he wants. However, the choice isn't his alone. The same thing is with the destiny that we have. He has given you an amazing God-destined destiny. It's beyond anything you can think, dream, or even imagine. It's huge. It's massive. And he's done everything on his part to allow you to walk in it. The only thing that is holding us back is our choices, our decisions that prevent us from attaining the destiny that God has given to us. We, we're, we're not people who sit back and say, God, please do this, please do this, why don't you do this? We're not the one waiting for him. Anybody feel you're waiting for God? Stop it. You're not waiting for him. He is waiting for you. He's been waiting for you since he laid the foundations of the earth to rise up and to choose and to walk in your destiny. He's waiting for us to make that choice to say, God, I rely on you completely. I rely on you totally. I'm not trusting in my job, my bank account, my family, my relationships. I'm not trusting in those things. I'm trusting in you and in you alone. When you do that, you begin to walk in your destiny. Now I'm preaching next week's message, so i got to get back to this week's. When we look at destiny, we can look throughout Scripture and we can see that God has intervened in the affairs of men on a regular basis. Everybody, You understand that? This whole idea that God started the ball rolling and stepped back and let things happen is, is just malarkey. There's no other word to describe it, okay? God has been internally invested on every single thing that has happened on this face of earth since he's created human beings. Now, has everything that happened been according to his will? No. Because there's a God of this age that is working and trying to destroy the works of God. The word of God calls him Satan or the devil, the enemy. He is doing everything he can do to stop you from reaching your destiny. And you know what? He is succeeding in many people's lives. And God is not going to put up with that. Because there are times where things have to happen because God's will is sovereign. And yes, we do have free will and we can choose to do things. But there are certain things that go beyond our human understanding, our human ability. And that's where God steps in and says, no, I want this to happen. This is going to happen. And there's nothing the enemy can do to stop it from happening. We call that destiny. And when we look throughout the Old Testament, we will see time after time of people who were given their destiny by God. And, and I started last week, in, or not too, last week, two weeks ago, getting into this. I want to dig in a little deeper. But does everybody understand the difference between an encounter and an experience? Okay? That's pivotal. Because a large percentage of charismatic churches and people who go to charismatic churches, they understand the experience. Okay? The experience is you come into church, you feel the presence of God, you, you feel good things, you, you, you feel happy, you feel a release, you, you get, maybe get healed, and you see things that are happening which are good. Okay? That's an experience. And experiences are good. However, the way I look at it, an experience is kind of like just getting your foot in the door. What we need to be seeking and what we need to be desiring is an encounter. What's the difference between an experience and an encounter? One word, direction. Okay? When you have an encounter with God, it will always follow up with a direction of what you're supposed to do. An experience will hold you to feeling good, 
Okay, you're feeling grouchy, you're feeling grumpy, you come into the presence of God that gets lifted up, you feel happy, you feel secure. That's all involved in experience, and that's good, okay? But that's not enough. We need to be looking and desiring the encounter. What is the encounter? The encounter is when you meet God face to face. When you meet God, and he explains the things that are going on and explains to you what he wants you to do. There's example after example of this in the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament. Let's just look at a few of them. I think i got 13 or 16 of them, so we'll just check a few of them. There's lots more. But the first one, Abraham's encounter with God. In Genesis chapter 18, you all know who Abraham is, right? He was Abram. God renamed him Abraham, said, I will make a great nation out of you. I will increase and I will pour out my glory through you. You will have multiple descendants more than the sands of the sea more than the stars in the sky this is when he was a hundred years old and had no kids that's why they call him the father of the faith okay because that takes a lot of faith you have more descendants than all the sand anybody ever try to count the sound can't be done and yet god told abraham you will have this uh the Lord visited Abraham, and he did it in the form of an angel. Now, I personally believe that this was Jesus, okay? I believe that this was a Christ experience where Christ showed up in the Old Testament and carried out actions and, and talked with people and set things in the right path, okay? When he came in, he encountered people and put them on the right path, put them in the right direction, we can see he talked, and it tells us that they talked for a while. There was Jesus and two other angels there. And he promised them that he would have a son. And then he told them about Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah? What do we think about when we think about Sodom and Gomorrah? People who are better behaved than us. Have you ever thought about that? Not us. We're righteous. When you see what they describe Sodom and Gomorrah is... That happens in our culture all the time. Our culture is far worse than anything Sodom and Gomorrah ever was. The only difference is is we're living under grace. They were living under the law. God came down and wanted to put things in the right direction. So he told Abraham what to do. What about Jacob? In Genesis chapter 28... Beginning in verse 12, we can read about Jacob's encounter with God. He started with a dream. Remember Jacob's ladder? Okay. He had a dream. He was sleeping on a rock as a pillow, which I can't imagine that being comfortable. But for him, that's what he chose. And he's laying there sleeping, and he has a vision of this ladder that goes from earth up to heaven. And there are constantly angels going up and down, up and down, up and down. That can tell you a little bit about what's happening. Okay. Angels are continually going back and forth. Why? Because they have a job to do, and they're doing it. And then Jacob looks up, and he sees God above the the, uh, ladder, and he's talking to him. He says, you're the the son of Abraham. I'm the God of Isaac. I'm the God of Abraham. God was painting a lineage for him, right? I was your grandpa's God. I was your dad's God. Now I want to be your God. He was painting the picture, giving him an indication of who he was. Jacob also had another encounter with God. In Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 24, Jacob wrestled with God. Does that disturb anybody? Me? I'd like to know how you do that. No, I don't want to do that. Let's clear that up. I don't want to wrestle with God because he's infinite. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. I don't think I'd have much of a chance. But Jacob wrestled with God. And as a result, God blessed Jacob, and Jacob saw him face to face. Okay, Remember, this is Old Testament. What about Noah? Here, Noah is in a very corrupt nation. Things are more depraved than they've ever been. Sodom and Gomorrah is taking place and uh, Noah's there and and the world is just chaos, anarchy the word the Bible describes it says and men did as they felt in their hearts to do without restraint 
Okay? They did whatever they thought was right. How does that describe our culture? Right? It's the same thing. It's the exact same thing. In our culture, there no longer is an absolute. Okay? Everything's relative. Truth? Oh, it's relative. doesn't matter if it's absolute for you. For me, it's relative. I can do what I want when I want because no one can tell me what to do. Same thing. Okay? Same story. And God came in and set things again down the path he wanted it to go. He brought things back. He removed the evil of the world. And he actually gave Noah a very detailed description of what he wanted to do. Because imagine just this for a moment. God comes to Noah and says, Noah, I want you to build a boat. Noah's probably like, what's a boat? Noah was landlocked. He, he probably never even seen a boat. And God's telling him to build a massive boat. Massive boat. Something today that confounds engineers today. They can't understand how it would actually work and how it would function. But God gave him detailed specs. What does this tell you? That during an encounter with God, God will give you the divine strategy you need to accomplish what he's called you to do. He doesn't just throw you out there and say, okay, I want you to go do this and have fun with it. Okay. No. When he, you have an encounter with God, he will give you detailed information, a detail, detailed divine strategy of how he wants you to carry it out. And it doesn't always coincide with human logic. Don't believe me? Remember Gideon? How many like Gideon? I'm the least of my tribe. My tribe is the least... I, I'm a nobody. How, who are you telling me what to do here? I, I can't do this. I'm untrained. You, you know the story. He tears on the Asherah pole and everybody wants to kill him. And then his father steps up and says, No, don't kill him. Let Baal be Baal. If Baal wants to deal with him, let Baal deal with him. That's a very smart thing to do. Why? Because, well, Baal was pretend. He didn't exist, so he couldn't really do anything. Well, actually, if you want to know the truth, he was a demon but he cannot do anything against God. So Baal was called out. He didn't do anything. So all of a sudden now Gideon is kind of higher up, okay? Higher up in his, his community because he, he took a stand and cut something. No, he did it in the middle of the night when he didn't think people would notice. But he did something that God told him to do. It was the first step. Because the next step that God wanted him to do, Gideon needed the faith that he gained during the first encounter in order to carry out what he needed to do the second time. The first time was cut down a pole. The second time was rout all of the enemies of Israel. Okay? There's a little bit of a difference. If you haven't noticed, there's a difference between cutting down a pole and routing an entire army who's invaded your land. That's a very prime lesson. God will always prepare you for what he's called you to do. And every single step that you have gone through in life, every single one of those things are something to prepare you for what you're called to do. He doesn't just flash you up and say, okay, bang, I want you to go take care of this. And it's like, God, that's impossible. Of course it's impossible, because if it was possible, he wouldn't be asking you to do it. So we need to look and see that, yes, understand that God is preparing you. From the beginning to the end. Nothing in your life that has happened has happened without God's knowledge, without his expertise, and without him being able to turn it into good. Now, sometimes his good takes a few years to come about. But when his good comes about, we're prepared. So Gideon, this is my favorite part here. Gideon is sitting there. The enemy comes in. They've invaded his land. They, they always do this at this time of year because the crops are at their full height. So they come in, destroy all the crops. Guess what that means? If somebody comes in, takes all your crops, you got no food, right? That's a bad thing. They came in and Gideon said, okay, I got a word from God. I'm going to go out. Well, I, I skipped a step here. This, oh, I'll tell you that later. That'll come later. Um, but Gideon gets raised up. He goes out, he sends out messengers all over. Come on, people of Israel, rise up. We're going to take out the enemy. Guess what happens? Too many people show up. Have you ever had that problem? You've had too many people to help? 
Well, no, we don't have that problem today, but that is exactly what happened. See, God looks over the enemy. He looks over his people of Israel who came up and he says, um, Gideon, I hate to tell you this, but you got too many men here. Too many fighters. Send them home. How many think that that makes sense? Okay, you're going to war, you're going to battle, and God tells you you have too many warriors. Anybody think that's a good idea, God? Probably not. You got too many. So Gideon does this really brave thing. He says, okay, men, if you're scared, if you have a smallest portion of fear in you, go home. And if you don't have fear, stay here. Guess what happens? 22 of the 33 leave. Okay, So basically, two-thirds of the men who were there take off. They're afraid. They leave. Okay, Gideon looks, okay, we can still do this. We still got enough guys. We can do this battle. We can win this fight. And then God comes up and says, what? Uh, Gideon, mm, you got too many men here. Because if you guys accomplish this, you will think you accomplished it in yourself. Rather than seeing that I'm the one who brought it about. So Gideon, you got to get rid of more of these men. And I want you to get rid of them by the... Take them down to the stream, have a drink of water. Those who put their head in the water and drink, send them home. Those who cup the water up and drink out of it, they can stay. Can you imagine what Gideon was thinking there? Okay, he's standing there watching these guys come up to the stream. Oh, don't do that. No. Oh, okay, you're gone. You know, the one comes... Oh, don't. You're gone. And eliminated it down to like, to the point at which they would have no possible chance of winning the victory. That's how God dwindled them down. There was no physical chance for them to have the victory. Anybody been there? You've been there? There's no chance of having victory? And that's exactly where God wanted him. Exactly where God wanted him. So that God could do things his way. We know the story, right? They gather around, they took lamps, they put jars over the lamps, they surrounded the enemy, and then they broke off the lamps, and they cheered a sword for the Lord and a sword for Gideon, right? And what happened? The enemy said, oh, who woke me up? Come on, it's daylight savings time. I want to keep sleeping. Leave me alone. No, they got up and they were afraid. They were fearful. Why? Because God had already driven the fear out of the people of Israel. You notice that first step? Anybody that is afraid, leave. The fear was no longer in Israel. There was nobody within the warrior forces who was afraid. All the ones who were afraid left. So when they came up and they were marching against their enemy, where was the fear? It was on the enemy because they had none. They were not afraid. They went out, they cracked their jars, shone their lights, they shouted out, and the enemy just kind of took up their swords and does what everybody does in the, end, in the Bible when they're against the people of God, is they kill themselves. Have you noticed that theme? Throughout the Old Testament, every time somebody rises up against Israel, God always provides a plan where they go and the enemy kills themselves. I'm just saying God's strategies are a little bit different than ours. We think we can build this up, we build this up, we build that up, and we can have that, and if we can overpower our enemy, then we can win the battle. But God says, "Uh, I've already won the battle. You don't need to build this, you just need to trust me, and I'll give it to you. That was Gideon. What about Moses? Well, Moses had a number of encounters. The first one, the burning bush. Bush is burning, but it's not burning. Bush is burning, but it's not burning. Hmm, I better go check that out. He goes and sees it, and God speaks to him. God tells him what he wants him to do. I hear the cries of my people, and I want to send you to deliver them. 
What is Moses' response? God, I don't speak very well. I have this, this problem. Um, they might not believe me when I go. Who am I? I can't do this. You know, th- there's a common theme throughout encounters in the Bible. And that's everyone who God encountered felt, felt that they were unable to do what God called them to do. So let me ask you, how many of you feel you're unable to do what God has called you to do? Well, you're in good company, okay? Because everybody who God used felt like they were unable to do it. And that's how God does things. So uh, then there was a time on the mountain where Moses went up and he was on Mount Sinai. There's a thick cloud. There's a voice of the trumpet. There's lightning. There's thunder. And all the people were down at the bottom of the mountain, and they're looking up on top of this mountain. They know Moses went up there, and they're just seeing all this wild stuff happening. Thunder clashing, lightning striking, clouds, just all this. And then the glory of God came upon Moses. And we know the story. This is where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. What were the Ten Commandments? God's direction for the people of Israel. This is how you're to live. This is the things to do. You see, every time God encounters, he brings direction. He brings focus. He brings purpose. What about Elijah? 1 Kings 19.11. He was there on Mount Horeb. There was a strong wind that rent the mountains and broke pieces of the rocks. It takes a pretty strong wind to break a rock. Okay? This wasn't just a gentle breeze. It wasn't, oh, that feels so refreshing. This was a mass of wind, okay, that was breaking rocks. I don't know if I'd want to be in that wind, but. And then there was an earthquake. And then there was fire that came down. And yet, it wasn't until God spoke in the still, small, quiet voice. You see, sometimes we look to encounter God in signs, miracles, and wonders. And those things are all good. But remember, those things are to follow those who believe. They don't lead those who believe. So those things occur and they follow after us. But there's a time where we need to step back and we need to say, God, I want to know your power. I want to know your glory right now. I want to encounter you. I want to know you. And that's a prayer God will answer. Uh, then what about Isaiah? Isaiah 6, one. Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. And the seraphim crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And the Lord talks to him. He takes the coal, touches his lips. What what does that mean? That means he's burning off all the garbage. And the only thing left is for him to speak the word of God. Okay? It was a cleansing ritual. It was a purification. And then God said, whom shall I send? Who will go for me? These are probably the most important words any man ever spoke in the Bible that are recorded. Isaiah responds, Here am I. Send me. That's guts. That's guts. God, send me. I'll go. I'll do it. You know, God is looking for Isaiah's right now. He's looking for men and women who will rise up and will say, you know what? My country matters. I will go and I will do what I need to do to bring them back to God. God, send me. Send me. What about Ezekiel? Well, God appeared like a... a, bow in a cloud and there was some brightness around all about and Ezekiel saw it he fell on his knees 
on his face, and then he heard the voice, and the Lord told him to be a watchman unto the house of Israel and to warn them. What was a watchman? A watchman's job was to sit in a tower and look and to see when the enemy approached. If the enemy approached, the watchman's job was to tell everybody to wake them up and to say, the enemy is coming. Now there was a price that was to be paid for a watchman. If a watchman fell asleep and the enemy came and ransacked the city, the blood of all the people was on the watchman's hands. However, if the watchman stood up and said, wake up, the enemy is coming, and the people just sat there and did absolutely nothing, the blood was on their own hands. That's a very important principle we have to understand. We are called to be watchmen in our workplaces. We are called to be watchmen in our political system, in our society, in our culture. We are to stand and we are to say, guess what? That is not right. Now, if we don't stand up and say that, their blood is on our hands. If we do stand up and say it and they completely ignore us, the blood is on their own hands. But we need to do what we've been called to do. What about Daniel? How many like Daniel? Daniel was a pretty cool guy. I just don't know if I agree with his eating habits. I I, I like meat too much, right? But it's going around. How many people have been on the Daniel fast? One couple. There you go. Good for you. More meat for me. Anyways, but Daniel, it's described, his, the, the book of Daniel, in his own name, describes an experience as follows, and this is when he encountered God. He saw a man whose body was like a barrel, and his face appeared like lightning. His eyes were as lamps of fire, his hands were as feet as brass, his voice was like the voice of a multitude. A quaking fell upon them, and they remained no strength in him. He heard the word, voice of the word, and it was in a deep sleep on his face. See, he fell down. Uh, he was without strength and uh, towards the ground. A hand touched him, set him back up on his knees and palms, and had a conversation with him. And when he touched him again, he regained his strength. Daniel encountered God and brought a people. He stood firm when they were in the darkness, when the people were in captivity, he was the one that stood up and represented what God wanted them to do, even in the light of difficulty. Throughout the scripture, there's many more. There's Peter, James, and John. They were with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Okay? They saw Jesus change. They encountered him. And a voice came out of the cloud and said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Again, every time there's an encounter, there's what? Direction. Okay? Every time there's an encounter with God, there is direction. Then there's Peter's encounter in Acts chapter 10, verse 10. Peter gets a vision. He falls into a trance and he sees a vision of a towel or sheet being lowered down and all of these animals on there that as a Jewish person he was not allowed to eat. And he said, forbid it, I can't do that, I can't eat that because I'm so righteous and holy. That's what he was saying. And God says what? What I have made clean, do not call unclean. So God comes in and he says, don't take these things that prevent these people from receiving my love. Don't hold on to them. Don't hold on to the things that prevent others from hearing my love. There's a message in that for us today. There's 120 who are in the upper room who encountered God. That's in the book of Acts. The day of Pentecost, Spirit comes down. There's Paul's encounter with God on the road to Damascus. He's riding his horse. A bright light shines, knocks him off his horse, tells him to do what? 
go to Damascus, find this person, and then this person will help you out. This person will deal with it. There's also John's encounter, which is in the entire book of Revelation. Here, John's encounter with God gave direction of what the end of the world is going to be like. What's going to happen? And he recorded it for us to see. So I'm going to ask you one last time. When you have an encounter with God, what happens? You get direction. How many people need direction? If you need direction, the place to get it is through an encounter. And that's why I have said for many, many years now, we need to look for encounters and not just be content with experiences. Experiences are good. They are great. Don't, don't belittle them, okay? We need experiences. Experiences will get us to the place where we can have encounters, okay? So let's look for that. Let's understand that. Um, I just want to close with this. I mentioned at the beginning of this that we had to mark your calendars. Why? Because there was a fresh anointing released in this place today. I saw it as clear as day. God has released an anointing to break the chains of what the enemy has been doing to hold people back from reaching their destiny. That is an anointing that rests on everyone who is here. If you were in this place during this time, you have that anointing on you. The word that came was all the things that were holding us back, all of the things, and I'm not going to put anybody on the spot here, but I can guarantee you that there's probably not a single person here who does not have something in their life that they struggle with on a regular basis. There are issues, whether they're they're blatant sins, whether they are just sins of omission, whether they are certain things, but I can guarantee that every person here has something like that, where they've struggled with, where they've not been able to get past it. It's been a cycle of sin, repent, sin, repent, sin, repent, and it just keeps going round and round and round. And there was a release today. This, this can come in the form of addiction. This can come in the form uh, of simply worry. Anytime we're missing the mark, it's the enemy's attempt to prevent us to reach the destiny God has given us. Every sin the enemy brings against you is simply put there to prevent you from reaching your destiny. That's what it's there for. And the word was so powerful today that the enemy no longer has that strength or that ability to affect you anymore. Get that? The enemy no longer has that ability over you. He no longer has that stronghold over you. He no longer has the power to make you do those things that you don't want to do. You know the Apostle Paul? I cannot do the things I should do. I do the things I can't. I do the things that I hate. If the Apostle Paul can be honest enough to relate that he deals with things that he can't get past, I think it's safe to say we can admit that too. That we end up doing things that we should not be doing, that we know we should not be doing, And we end up doing the very things that we hate to do, but we do them anyways. Why? Because there's a devil who's here to kill, steal, and destroy. But no more. No more. Christ has released that anointing in this place. Not only for us. It begins with us. Okay, This is for you. If there's something that you're dealing with that you can't get past... You mark it on your calendar, today's the end of that. It's done with. It's over with. No more. You're walking in a new path. You were walking... Uh, I, oh, I know I said that was the last thing I want to share, but I was reading this verse. Um, Psalms 
51, I believe it is. Um, I'll have to double check. But the New Living Translation, David says, give me a new week, or a new Genesis week. And I'm like, that is good. That, boy, David, you know how to write. Like, wow. Give me a new Genesis week. A new beginning is basically what he's saying. A new start. Um, David wrote this after his affair with Bathsheba, after he was confronted by Nathaniel, right? And he came in and he said, you, you guys know the story, I don't want to get into it, but this is what David wrote after that experience, okay? And he's saying, God, give me a new start, a new beginning. I was just reading that this morning while I was praying and worshiping in here before anybody else was here. And I, I just said, God, just give us a new beginning, a new start. And that is what he's done. That is what he's done. He's given each and every one of us a new start, a new beginning. Okay? Forget about what happened last week. Forget about the things that are holding you back. Forget about everything that is inhibiting you from receiving the full abundance that God has for you. Okay? It's no longer there. Today's a new beginning. Today's a new start. Walk in the newness of the life that Christ has given. And it's, gonna, it's with this anointing. And with every anointing, it's for you to share with others. If you know people who are struggling with things, and, and what I see happening in the weeks to come, in your workplaces, in, in, in malls, people are going to come up to you, and they're going to ask you how to get free from the bondages that are holding them back. They're going to come to you and ask you, what's your answer going to be? Your habit, don't worry. Okay, don't be fearful. You have the victory in you and you will be able to share it with others. This is the beginning of something amazing right here. Mark it off on your calendar, March 13th, 2016. Is that right? Wow. Good year. Better years are coming. Okay? Better years are coming. Wait till you see 2019. Good stuff happening there. But 2016, good things are here. This is the beginning. This is the start. Every one of us has a fresh beginning, a fresh start. If there is something in your life that you want to get rid of, today's the day. Today's the day. It doesn't hold you back anymore. The enemy is, doesn't, he not, oh. Yeah, he's a little ticked off right now. As he should be. You are not held back, but you can start entering your destiny. You're never too old. You've never missed your destiny. It's never too late to start it. How can I say that? Well, who gave you your destiny? God. Who knows everything about time and space? God. Would he give you something that couldn't be fulfilled? No. He knew exactly what you were going to do. Every mistake, every decision, everything you've ever done, he knew, foreknew it. He knew it before you did it. So your destiny is beyond that. Does that mean we can keep screwing up and keep making the same mistakes? No, because that just hurts you. It doesn't remove your destiny, but it brings pain and discomfort into your life, which who wants that? Nobody wants that. So I want everyone just to stand up. And I want you just to say this. I declare, today is a new day. I get a new beginning. The old things are past. And the future is great. In Jesus' name I declare. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for what you did today. We give you the glory. We give you the praise. And Lord, we are so thankful for this anointing that you've released in this place. And God, I see this anointing flowing out of these walls, to, even to other churches, to, to other workplaces. God, I just see like a geyser that is bubbling up right now. It's bubbling, it's bubbling, and it's just spreading everywhere it goes. 
kind of like a, a big circle just flowing out. And God, that's your anointing that is just breaking the yokes of bondage in people's lives. Oh, God, we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, for the worship that is taking place in this house. Lord, we thank you that we can lift you up. We can exalt you. And Lord, we choose to exalt you. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Thank you, God, for the hope and the security that we have in you. Thank you, Lord, that we have nothing to fear. We have nothing to fear. All the fear is gone and been taken from us and put on the enemy. It's the enemy who is afraid right now. No more fear. We take that fear and in an act of faith, we remove it from us and we place it on the enemy's head. And he can be fearful for what God is doing. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus.